Hello, 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 everybody, um, and welcome. Thank you for joining our webinar today. We plan on having quite an informative session today to discuss are you protected from ransomware, uh, uh, ransomware attacks and basically safeguarding your business in an evolving threat landscape. Um, so today's webinar is brought to you by IMSM, which is International Management Systems Marketing, and we're ISO specialists, and we're in collaboration today with Digis. Now, Digis are a cybersecurity firm, and they're based in San Antonio in Texas. Okay, my name's Carolyn. I'm a marketing executive at IMSM, and I'll briefly uh, introduce both our presenters today, um, and then I'll be off in the background to the end and available if you need me. So please do drop any questions in the chat and I'll respond to those and hopefully we'll bring them up on the screen later on. Um, okay, so today we have two presenters um, uh, and that's um, Olumide and uh, Manny. Um, Olumide is a technical specialist uh, I'm reading this, so just bear with me. <laughs> Ollie White is a technical specialist at IMSM, uh, and he's based in Malmesbury in the UK. Um, so he's earned a reputable standing in the field, has over two decades of experience across various roles, including implementation, auditing, and training. So Ollie White is a CQI and IRCA accredited quality management system trainer, um, and he's got expertise across diverse standards, sort of including ISO 9001, ISO 27001, information security management systems. So Manny is a cybersecurity fundamentalist. Um, he's a thought leader and subject matter expert with over two decades of cross-sector and cross-continental um, expertise and experience, really. So Manny has actually authored and developed one of the most widespread cybersecurity courses on Udemy, so that's cybersecurity operations and technology solutions for the Udemy business collection in 2019. And that involved reaching over 20,000 students in over 150 countries. Um, so Manny is a CEO and he's a founder of a cybersecurity form called Digis. And that's a company that provides world class cybersecurity solutions to organizations of all sizes across the globe. So let's get into our presentation today, and we will start with Manny. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone, wherever you're watching from. And we're so glad that you could join us today. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about ransomware. Um, you know, it shouldn't be the first time that most of us are hearing about it. So we're going to talk about polymorphism first and then uh, polymorphic malware, uh, specifically ransomware. Then we look at some ransomware statistics. Then I'll demonstrate, you know, a sample anatomy of a ransomware attack. Then I'll show you the operation overview, uh, you know, to kind of like give you um, make you understand that the barrier of entry is not really steep for criminals who are trying to uh, operate ransomware services or platforms. Um, and then we'll look at the recent case study. Uh, please go to the next slide. So polymorphism is, is simple. It's an occurrence of several different forms of individuals among the members of a single species. So this derives from, it's essentially a biological term, but in cybersecurity, specifically in ransomware, it is used to describe the changing nature of a malware. So malware authors uh, have mastered the act of using polymorphism to evade uh, security software to evade detection by security software. So, and polymorphic ransomware is just a variant of polymorphic malware. So if you think about what polymorphism is to malware, you know, it's exactly, you know, the idea, it's, you know, polymorphic uh, ransomware authors use polymorphism to increase their success rates 
you know, the modify encryption algorithm, communication method, command and control infrastructures, all because they want to bypass security measures. Uh, next slide. So, you know, ransomware is a big problem for organizations today across the globe, uh, but it is more of a problem for organizations in the, in first world countries, specifically in North America and Europe. And you can see this, uh, this recent statistics, uh, they were gathered from a platform called Venalix. I can see that, you know, more than six out of every 10 ransomware attack targeted organizations in the US, right? And closely followed, well, not closely followed, uh, but was followed by Canada, then closely followed by the United Kingdom. So these three countries are the popular destinations for ransomware threat actors. And you know, on the right hand side there, you can also see the top targeted sectors. Uh, we have industrial sectors leading the chart there, then consumer dis uh, discretionary and healthcare. So if your organization is in any of these sectors, uh, then, and if you haven't suffered a ransomware attack, then you have to be prepared. Uh, you have to do everything possible to reduce the risk of a successful ransomware attack uh, to your organization. Because if they are targeting your sector, then you know chances are they will get to your organization at some point. Next slide. So these are recent victims in the US. Uh, it's very difficult for me to see uh, here, but you can see that there are many pages there. You know, I can't really see that number, but on this page, you see, you, you can see nine victims. And this is, ju this is just in the month of March, right? 2024. So this is, this is a big problem and the barrier of entry is low. So, um, and I'll be talking more about that, uh, you know, later on. So go ahead, please, next slide. So these are UK victims as well. Uh, next slide. Okay, so typical cyber attack flow, you know, this is, this architecture or, or, or uh, anatomy of attack is, it can apply to any type of attack, but I'm gonna use it to explain how a ransomware threat actor can successfully, um, you know, if they, if, if they are successful in bypassing all your security controls, um, you know, you're gonna see how much of a problem that is. So one there, so if you hit the keyboard, um, hit the button, or do it there. Right, so for the email attack vector, uh, most ransomware attacks uh, are caused through malicious emails, you know, malicious links in emails, a malicious attachment. So they send an email to, it could be, a, you know, regular phishing email or a spare phishing email, which is like a targeted attack. So these threat actors in, in a targeted attack scenario, they identify a target and then they craft the message in a way that you know resonates with the target. And you know, there's usually a call to action. Once that action is taken, then you know if your security controls are not functioning well, then you could be a, a victim of a ransomware attack. So right here, we see the email going through. So uh, if you think about layers of defense, um, organizations typically invest in secure email gateway. So that is your first layer of defense. You know, if you have a very good secure email gateway uh, that is properly tuned, you should be able to detect most um, ransomware uh, attack 
through most attacks that are coming through email. So whether it's a link to a malicious website or it's a malicious attachment. So, but if they successfully bypass your secure email gateway, then you rely on your end user. You know, hopefully your end user has undergone, uh, have undergone uh, security awareness training. So you rely on your end users to spot this uh, malicious email and not take the action intended by the criminal or, or cyber adversary. Now, if your user fails, so that's layer two failing, then the malware gets deployed on the handpoint, you know, on the on the computer. So here's where you have layer three. If you have a good EDR solution, endpoint detection and response solution, then you know, hopefully it stops the malware from getting deployed. Um, but if you don't, the adversary may uh, harvest credentials or, or write on an existing session, especially if the user is an administrative user that has, you know, lives, uh, existing sessions to critical resources, you know, maybe in the cloud or premise, then the criminal can impersonate the user to then do whatever the user is able to do in this environment. And that could include deploying malicious uh, software that can do anything, you know, uh, the, the attacker wants it to do. And in this case, they could deploy a, a malware that would encrypt, you know, will find and encrypt critical files uh, and also break critical business processes. And you can see there, so that's a path to fall. So once your systems have been encrypted uh, and your data have been encrypted, then you get this message on the screen saying, you know, uh, we got you in order to uh, decrypt your files. Hi everyone. Um, Manny obviously has got some technical problems, but I'm sure he'll be back in just a moment. Um, Olimite, do you have any comments to make on um, what uh, Manny's been talking about? Uh, you just need un to unmute yourself. Oh yes. <laughs> okay, yeah, well, um, just like the webinar is designed, this particular one, there's a technical aspect, and there is the management system aspect of it. Yes, I'm aware of all he's speaking about. He's just talking mm -hmm. about how ransomware attack propagates from inception until how it gets into the system of um, the targets. Okay, so that's basically what he's um, explaining. Okay, yeah. so, uh, but I'm um, looking at it from the management system point of view yeah it makes a lot of sense and that's why a standard like the iso 20 7001 comes into play yeah now yes. the standard is designed in such a way to identify risk associated with cyber security okay so yeah. now implementing the requirement of the standard becomes a useful tool to safeguard against this type of um, cybersecurity attacks. And that speaks about the concepts of management system. The ISO 27001 2022, which is the most recent version of the standard, is, um, is published on the premise of three concepts of management system. And the first one is the risk-based approach, which I'll speak about briefly. Yes. So the standard itself, speaks about how to identify risk and how to manage it. So the standard Sorry. is okay. Man is back. Okay. Ma Man no is worries. back. <laughs> okay. We held we held the fort for a few minutes. So yeah. Yeah. 
No worries. So, so let, let me, me just show wrap you. up. Yeah, I'll just wrap up because I'm I'm getting close to the end of it. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so, so thank you for that. So at that point, they, you know, they display a message on your screen that you've been ransomed. Uh, so that's a path from one, two, three, uh, to, to four, the first four, which is uh, if you have uh, services in AWS, for example, you have workloads there, you know, do not think that because of that, you are immune to ransomware attack, right? Because the security within security within the cloud is your responsibility. So um, if they manage to get into your email system, they can exfiltrate data or, you know, say Google Drive, for example, if the motivation is not extortion, if the motivation is maybe espionage, or just data theft, they can get into um, your uh, data repository online, you know, storage repos and just exfiltrate that data that way. Now, if, you're, if you have an endpoint protection system, hopefully it blocks the deployment of malicious software. But if it doesn't, if you have a, you know, a secure web gateway solution, you know, looking at your outbound traffic. So that's, you know, two going, you know, to the far right on, on the top. Then that secure web gateway software can block malicious traffic to that, uh, you know, command and control uh, system. So can you go to the next slide? Again, I can't, I can't really see on the screen. But just go to the next slide, uh, slide. So I can tell you a little bit uh, about my uh, ransomware operation. So at the top there, you see uh, the popular ransomware platforms like Logbeat. Um, you know, they, they've, there are a lot of high profile data breaches that have been caused by Logbeat ransomware. Uh, what is important to know is that these threat actors are not just working alone. They work with a lot of affiliates. They work with a lot of individual criminals who just go in, you know, they go on the dark web. Um, they are hired to operate the ransomware platforms. So these guys recruit army of cyber criminals and, you know, that is why a lot of organizations are getting breached. It, it's not that the ransomware authors are the one really operating the, the ransomware service. It's an ecosystem. So the affiliates, if they successfully uh, take over or, or you know, encrypt um, you know, systems of an organization, then the money, when the, the money is paying into a Bitcoin wallet, it's going into the wallet of the ransomware uh, operators and then the affiliate just get a commission. So it's a pretty, it's a pretty serious uh, uh, operation and criminals are heavily incentivized to keep uh, attacking organizations. So, you know, those on the good side should be incentivized to keep helping organizations to stay secure. Next slide. Right, so this is just the, you know, the, the uh, flow of the operation. They recruit an affiliate, the affiliate acquires access, and then they try to deliver payload. That's where infection and encryption uh, happens. Then the victim gets the ransomware notes and then you know, ransom payment handling and all that is done by the threat actors. So this is a, um, so this is not a victim. You, so that's a, ignore the air that they But very recently, that's, can you go back? Very recently, uh, United Health, a, a big organization in the healthcare sector, 
in the USA was rumored to have paid $22 million in ransom. And last week, the CEO was invited to the, where, uh, to, to the White House to come and talk about you know what happened and so this is this happens a lot especially for publicly traded organizations in the us if your organization gets breached you would have to go face you know you face the, the senate or or you know go to the white house you're in the news for the wrong reasons so you know again it's important for organizations to to understand the, the how bad things can get when a ransomware attack occurs so i'll rest here and pass it over to Illumide to speak about the iso 27001 implications of this all right thank you very much manny um, well, um, for our listeners, we've had um, a brief insight on how ransomware attack operates and um, from the start to how it propagates within the system and the end results. Now, the big question is, do we want to get to this point of getting attacked? Because really, Looking at the illustration that we just that we saw a couple of minutes ago, you can see that it's a lot of process involved. So, trying to clear this mess is going to be um, it was going to take a, a toll on a lot of resources. So, to avoid this, um, luckily there are a few management system standards that has been developed, that has been published to address specific situations, specific circumstances. And for the purpose of today's discussion, we'll be looking at the requirements of ISO 27001 2022, which is the standard that was published for information security management system. Now, um, this standard is, um, is published and is based on three main concepts. And I'll speak about each of the concepts briefly. The first one, which I feel is the most important, is a risk-based risk approach or risk-based thinking. And with that approach, what it simply means is that for organizations, you need to have an idea of what are your peculiar internal factors. And these internal factors can be derived from your values, from your culture, from the knowledge of your organization and from the performance of the organization. And having information security or cyber security attack in the back of our mind, the standard expects us to have identified what are the threats to our cyber security activities. What are the weaknesses? And when all these things have been determined, they have been identified. They have initially identified as a factor. It is not yet a risk until when further assessment is conducted. So the risk-based thinking is simply telling us to be proactive rather than being reactive. Now in the scenario that we saw earlier, an attack might have occurred, and we're looking for ways to address it, to minimize the effect. But with the implementation of the requirement of the standard, we are looking at um, preventing the attack from happening in the first place. And that's the premise on which the standard was published on. So we are looking at risk-based approach in terms of ensuring that all the all the factors that can affect us towards um, a breach in the confidentiality of our data and information, or some or factors that can affect the integrity of the information that we possess, and other issues that can affect the availability of our data and information, which we simply call the confidentiality, integrity, and availability 
of data and information is addressed before it becomes an issue. So that's a concept of risk-based approach. So we have identified the factors, which can be a threat, which can be a weakness. Then we go ahead to conduct an assessment, which we call information security risk assessment. And this assessment is conducted using some acceptable criteria. And that's a criteria for risk assessment to see how significant these threats and weaknesses can be. And based on the ass assessment, then we'll be able to evaluate those risks and prioritize them. So when risk are identified, they analyze or assessed using an acceptable criteria. We identify risk owners. And the last thing we do on that point is to prioritize the risk for risk treatment. So coming back to the risk treatment point, then we look, we decide to take actions to address those significant risks by establishing controls. So we'll first of all establish the controls that is capable of addressing all this risk that we have identified. And when we are done with the controls that we have established, then we make a reference to the Annex A of the ISO 27001-2022, where 93 controls have already been established in there. These controls are subdivided into four. We have the organizational control, 37 in all. We have the people's control, which is eight. Then we have the physical control, 14 in all. Then we have the technological controls, which is 34. Now, in the review of the standard from the 2013 version to the 2022, 11 new controls were added to the existing um, controls that we had. Out of these 11 new controls, seven of them are technological controls, which clearly shows that the standard has made cybersecurity issues a focus that needs to be addressed. So we make use of these controls as reference document to see if there are additional controls that we need to address. So it is clearly so it's clear that by the time the requirement of ISO 27001 is implemented, all the possible controls in form of risk that may affect our cybers that can affect our cybersecurity will have been addressed. So that's why the implementation of the standard becomes an important tool to prevent against ransomware attacks and all other things. And at this point, I'll quickly share my screen for us to have um, a better view on what we need to do in terms of um, cybersecurity. Just a minute. Let me do this. Okay, so just a minute. Okay. Okay, so um like I said, we speak about I've spoken about the risk based thinking. Okay, the next thing there that we need to speak that we need to understand is that um, another concept of process approach is um, one of the concepts that the standard was um, based on, meaning that for every organization, we need to establish processes. And for each of those processes, we need to determine what are the peculiar issues depending on the process, okay? So for example, the executive management there may be threats or weaknesses around development of policies, you know, around readiness for business continuity and all of that. For operations, we may have issues around how to identify threat intelligence, configuration management, data masking, and all of that. For the procurement, as an example, we might be able to, we might be having issues around managing information security for use of cloud services, you know, and all of that. So office administration, physical security monitoring can be a threat to a business. Working in secure area, protecting against physical and environmental threats, these are likely risk 
So any organization that is focusing on ensuring that information security management system is properly implemented. For the human resources, screening, disciplinary actions, remote working are factors that may be considered. So all of this becomes part of what is considered in information security management system. The third concept is a PDCA, which simply means that the standard is um, subdivided into four quadrants, ensuring that the planning phase takes the bulk of the work. So that buttresses the risk-based approach that I said earlier, because it means that every organization is being proactive to ensure that none of these attacks comes close by ensuring that planning is properly done, objectives are set, resources are provided, and everything is done before the real execution, okay? Now, speaking about the Annex A, where the statement of applicability is developed, the controls are distributed and they have different attributes. So that makes it easier for us to make a choice on the control that will be most relevant to a particular risk or particular activity that we want to, that, that is of focus. Some of these controls can be preventive, some can be detective, some can be corrective, and you can have a control that can take combination of two or the three, okay? Then talking about information security properties, some of them addresses confidentiality, some addresses integrity, and some of them addresses availability. And you can have a particular control that can address the three. Now, speaking about the cybersecurity concepts, some of these controls is developed strictly for the purpose of identifying cybersecurity issues. Some are for the purpose of protecting against it. Some are for the purpose of detecting cybersecurity activities, and some are to respond possibly to an incident, a cybersecurity attack. And some are for the purpose of recovery after an incident has been recorded. So these attributes helps every organization to be able to select which control is the best fit for a particular risk that is meant to be addressed. Then operational capabilities is also there to assess about supplier relationship, legal and compliance, and all of that. Then the last attribute there is the security domains to see whether a control is strictly relevant to governance and ecosystem, is it for protection, is it for defense or resilience, okay? Now, I'll speak briefly about implementation process. There's a planning phase, there's an implementation phase, and there's a monitoring and review phase. The implementation phase, just speaks about conducting a gap analysis. That is for organizations that have signified interest in getting certified or getting the requirements of the S27001 implemented. A gap analysis will be conducted to have an idea on the documents that have been provided because the standard requires some documents to be mandatory, some records to be mandatory, and some activities to be mandatory. So during a gap analysis, all of this will be ascertained to see if there is any issue. And when there are gaps, they are closed and the document presentation is um, follows, which clearly states that the implementation process has been completed. So when this is completed, there's a need to continue to monitor and measure the implemented process. And the two main tools that the standard has um, pres prescribed one of it is conducting internal audits and the other one is to conduct management reviews because these two activities is categorized on the performance evaluation for us to have an idea of how well a management system is performing. So during these two activities, we can ascertain whether the controls that has been adopted to, ad to address a particular risk is effective or not because it's part of the review input for discussion or if there's a need for further action to ensure that um, our processes are managed in such a way that we can achieve our desirable results and we can work in a safe environment free of ransomware attack. So that's the beauty of implementing the standard. Now, speaking briefly about the importance 
talk about risk assessment and management. And there are specific controls that addresses each of these importance. So based on what we have determined, there are strict controls that we can reference as a document for the purpose of ensuring that we have all this importance well implemented. So the risk assessment and management is one of it. Security awareness and training is one of it. From the previous uh, presentation from Mali, we can see that um, there's a need for awareness to be created within an organization on what needs to be done when issues come up, what are the trainings, what are the competency requirements, so that when ransomware attack is looming or it seems like something that is inevitable, how can we guide against it? How can we avoid it? So there's a need for security awareness training. And there are controls in the Annex A that talks about all these things. Then incident response and planning in a situation where there has been a cybersecurity attack. The standard clearly explains on how to address that with controls that are relevant to that subject. Okay. Now, data backup and recovery is another requirement of the standard that has controls. In fact, there is a control specifically for information backup. That's the A8.13. And there are other controls that speaks specifically about data backup and recovery. Okay, access control is another area of um, working in such a way that ransomware spreading can be mitigated in an organization. Okay, now briefly on the benefits, of course, enhanced data protection, and that is what we want. So clearly shows that the Implementing the requirement of 27,001 gives us that leverage for enhanced data protection, then improved risk management, then compliance with legal and regulatory requirements. Okay, I gave a few examples there, depending on the region we operate. There are regulatory requirements that the standard expects us to comply with, somewhere in clause 4.2. In fact, one of the additional requirements is to, ensure, is to demonstrate how to meet the needs and expectations of interested parties through information security management system. So implementing that eliminates the risk of any organization, I mean, being caught on the wrong side of the law, okay? Now, the last thing there is, is of course, ensuring confidentiality, integrity, and availability of data and information. Um, I'll quickly go through the changes, plus 4.2. That's one of the changes from the 2013 to the 2022 that talks about demonstrating how each of the requirements will be met through the information security management system. Another change is an elaborate process approach, ensuring that in any organization, processes are established and you determine the input required, the output expected, then there must be a sequence and interaction of these processes to ensure that no process is a standalone. Then we need to apply, define and apply criteria for monitoring and measuring the performance of these processes. Ensure that resources are available, responsibilities are assigned and communicated, risks are determined. So this is a, it is a major change from the old standard, ensuring that the um, Establishing processes for information security management system becomes robust, similar to what is obtainable in the quality management system standard of 9001. Then the risk assessment process is just a little bit of tweak on that, stating the steps to be taken on how to identify threats, how to establish risk assessment criteria, identifying risk owners, you know, then um, identify risk associated with the loss of confidentiality, integrity, and availability, which ransomware attack is one of them, okay? And when all of this has been determined, you analyze and evaluate the risk, then prioritize the risk for risk treatment. So the new standard speaks extensively about the information security risk assessment process. Then, of course, the risk treatment process was another area that was elaborated elaborated further. And the previous um, Annex A with 114 controls was reviewed downwards to 93 controls. 
And this control serve as a reserve after we have initially identified the controls that are unique to our organization. Then we refer to that Annex A to see if there are additional controls that we need to consider, that we need to address. And after that, we formulate our statement of applicability and we develop our risk treatment plan. This can only be achieved when the implementation, when the requirement of the 27,001 is implemented successfully. So that clearly shows that implementing the requirement of 27,001 gives a, it gives a better option for us to guide against this ransomware attack. Okay, setting objective with emphasis on setting it at functional levels and monitoring it was another additional requirement. Planning of changes was an entirely new clause introduced into the standard, talking about carrying out change in a planned manner. Of course, then in communication, how to communicate was included in there. Then clause 8.1 speaks more about establishing criteria for the processes that has been established in clause 4.4 and implementing controls of the processes, you know, having documents and records as evidence that the activities have been carried out, then ensuring that externally provided processes in information security management system is controlled. So that's the basically. Now, briefly, from the 2013 to the 2022, the initial controls of 114, out of that 114 controls, 53 controls were merged, three controls were deleted, and 11 new controls were included. So that's the basic difference between the Annex A of the 2013 and the 2022. Okay, uh, well, in conclusion, um, we all know that um, information security management system plays an important role in ransomware prevention. So it will enable organizations to identify, assess, and mitigate cybersecurity risk effectively with the implementation of information security management system. And with the security controls being implemented and raising awareness among employees and developing incident response capabilities, we can enhance our resilience against ransomware attacks and safeguard our valuable assets and reputation. Okay, so. That's about it. Over to you, Caroline. That was fantastic. Thank you both so much. Um, I'm sure people are going to really appreciate your discussion today. But that's not where it ends, because um, we do have some questions that have come through. Um, and I hope you have time to spend 10 minutes or so answering no them. I think, they're, I think they're really relevant to the conversation we've just been having. Um, so if you just bear with me, I'll pop them up on the screen one by one um here we go so the first one um what should be the immediate steps after detecting a ransomware infection that's for money yes so for end users the immediate uh step should be to contact your app desk or depending on the organization, you know, the first point of call could be the app desk or the information security team. So the ra a ransomware attack announces itself, right? You, you know, you cannot be doubting whether this is a ransomware attack or not, because you're gonna see the message and you would not be able to do anything. So the first step is from everything you're doing, let your information security know. now. If information security happens to be the first point of detection, then hopefully you already have your incident response process and ransomware specific response process because there are a lot of things um, you know that need to be uh, taken into consideration. Um, so more mature organizations uh, would have done like tabletop exercises. So you would have a policy around, oh, should we pay the ransom? You know, if we ever find ourselves in this situation or not, who needs to be informed? We have customers, you know, whose services will be impacted, you know, who is going to lead that communication? So uh, if you have corporate communications, then corporate communication should already have 
that message. Mm. That's actually, sorry, uh, that uh, you were just talking then. It's actually one of the questions that was popping up was, what's your opinion about paying or not paying a ransom? Yes, so, oh, yes, so I'll, I'll pay, I'll, I'll address that as well, but I just wanted to finish my thought on, you know, it, because it is very important that you communicate to the public, you know, because if you don't, the bad guys are doing it, right? The bad guys are going to do it. They're going to post. They, they have something they call ransomware wall of shame. So they'll post there that, oh, this organization has been ransomed. We have, you know, one terabyte of their data. We're asking them they pay, to pay. They don't want to pay. So most of the time, there's no hiding place. So the best thing to do is to have a clear message. Let your most organizations will say, oh, we're having issues right now. Uh, we took some of our systems offline and we'll keep you posted. Something like that, just admitting that, okay, you know, we have issues. Now, in terms of uh, paying or not paying, that is a, that's a difficult one, but it depends on the, uh, the policy of the organization. You know, uh, the FBI will tell you, do not pay because there's no guarantee that you will get your data back right but if your business is suffering your customers cannot access the services do you want to take your chances it's just like the the the, the ransom like the the human ransom situation you know uh being taken off stage and saying you have to pay you have a relative right uh you know hopefully not but you have a relative that have been taken by kidnappers and the same pain the ransom and the government is telling you do not pay well i have a loved one i'm gonna take my chances so it's you know it depends on the organization what i would just say is think about this ahead understand your position the decision makers should know the position of the company so for example america will tell you we do not negotiate with terrorists period right so if you're not going to do not don't be deciding whether you want to pay or not in the eye of the storm, right? So whether you want to pay or not, you should know before a ransomware attack ends. Yeah, I think that's it's good to, to know what you would do in that situation, isn't it? Beforehand, have a strategy, have a plan. Um, right. Um, I've popped another one up on the screen, if somebody wouldn't mind answering it, if, if you have the time, is how do we recover data lost to a ransomware attack? Oh well, it's still for so, money. Yeah, well, hopefully, hopefully you have your backup, right? Because if you haven't backed up your data, it's gone, right? So, so I'll I'll, I'll also answer it differently. Uh, how can we decrypt the encrypted data? So there are you know working groups. Uh, so if you go to uh, no ransom, no more ransom .org, you see that you know if if your organization uh, is suffering a, a ransomware attack, you could be lucky. This uh, working group might have a decryption key, so they have decryption keys for some uh, variants of, of ransomware. Um, so there are also other resources online that you can use. To at least try to decrypt it by yourself first. Yeah. If you fail to do that and you don't have your data backed up, it's game over. Sorry, you have to yeah. start all over <laughs> or put the ransom. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for that. I've got a question here um, for Olumide from Dane Lance. Please, can you address the organizational size? Who can afford to implement ISO 27001? Okay. Oh, I'm smiling because a similar question popped up with me yesterday at the training. <laughs> well, implementing the requirements of um, any management system standard, ISO 27001 inclusive, is irrespective of size. So, a one man business, an organization with just one personnel, can be certified to the requirement of ISO 27001. The only difference or the only area 
that may be of concern is during the performance evaluation where internal audits need to be carried out. There's a requirement in clause 9.2 of the standard that speaks about selecting auditors for objectivity and impartiality purpose, meaning that you cannot audit your own work. That's the only place it becomes tricky. So in that, in that case, a one-man organization can outsource the internal audit process to a third party, to a consultant, for that to be, to be conducted. Management review, not necessarily a meeting, so a one-man business can take a decision on opportunities for improvement or any need for changes to his information security management system. So it's only in the area of internal audit that you may need an additional party to conduct that for you. But the rest, the others, a one-man business is suitable and is fit for the purpose of implementing the requirement of ISO 27001. Yeah, that's really good comment. Um, I just there's one of these other questions that came through, and I was just thinking about Ma what Manny was saying about having a strategy, having a plan in place, what you would do in a certain situation. But this question says, how should we communicate with stakeholders, customers during and after a ransomware attack? Um, so typically, obviously, we have people that can't get onto a website, or you know, they can't get onto the interface they normally log into, um, and they're they're worried what's happening. How should we address that? Yeah, so that's why you need your corporate communications department and your legal department. You know, legal uh, and compliance legal would understand the implication of it if there, you know, could be a potential class action lawsuit. If this is not properly managed, it is also important that you uh, be open with your partners or, or you know organizations that you're providing services to. Um, you know, that's very important because there, there could be repercussions if you're impacting their business, their, their businesses, and you're not being upfront with them. Uh, so, you know, communication, is whatever goes to the public can be properly managed, right? But what you want to tell your customer, um, you have to be as detailed as possible. You might not want to put it in writing. You might just do like a webinar like this you know uh controlled and then just let them tell them the details of what happened you know because if it's not written down then you know uh you're kind of like uh, limiting the the pool of audience right yeah yeah, yeah. definitely um i was going to say have we got time for one more question do you think yeah, we can take it. Yes. Are you sure? Yes. Okay, let's let's go for it. Um actually there's one here that's interesting because I didn't I haven't heard about this. Um it says let me just bring it up on the screen. Um what role does cybersecurity insurance policies play in ransomware preparedness and response? Uh a lot and none. So it depends on <laughs> it depends on you know the, the due diligence that you've done when procuring uh, a ransomware you know insurance. Um, and by the way, in this day and age, a lot of insurance providers will not cover you if you don't have a solid plan in, in place. So if if you're sorry, I'm just getting distracted. <laughs> If you haven't invested in cybersecurity, um, you know, if they, they typically have like questionnaire, do you have a CISO, do you have business continuity and start recovery planning and all that. And if you don't answer yes to a lot of those questions, you, you can't be insured anyway. Now, if you have cyber insurance and you think, oh, now I have cyber insurance, I can get, you know, I'll be fine, even if I get some ransomware attack. Um, you know, you could be in a worse situation than not even having uh, an insurance at all, because false sense of security is worse than, you know, no security at all. So it's important to, to know that insurance is not, you know, it's not a panacea. Right, having like cyber insurance, you have to look at the clauses very closely. 
you know, and then ask the right questions. It can help you. So, for example, some insurance uh, carriers will pay maybe up to 50% of the ransom if you dis do decide to pay ransom, right? Uh, but they're not gonna, they're not, they're not gonna help you. They're not going to make your problem go away, basically. Okay, okay. On that note, um, I just want to actually say thank you so much for taking the time out today to give this really beneficial webinar for people that are interested in ISO 27001 and cybersecurity. I really appreciate you appearing and, and taking time out for us. Um, if anybody does have any questions for Olumide or Manny, um, please drop a comment below. Um, and we can we'll make contact with you um, and hopefully help you out and um, it's been a pleasure I think it's time that we now head back to our day jobs <laughs> and uh, yeah thank you so very very much um, and uh, thank you everybody for attending today yeah. all right thank you take care bye, bye. yep